Each year on November the 11th, Britain's Royal Navy celebrates one of its most remarkable victories. But these officers are gathered not to celebrate a great battle fought out by mighty battleships at sea, but an extraordinary feat of arms carried out by a supposedly obsolete biplane. For on November the 11th, 1940, 21 fairy swordfish took off from the carrier Illustrious and decimated the Italian fleet in its home port of Taranto. It was a defining moment in the history of air power. If some had dismissed naval aviation as merely a means of providing the eyes of the fleet, Taranto proved it could also deliver a knockout punch. The dominance of the battleship was rapidly coming to an end as events of the next four years were to show. During the First World War, the Royal Navy's air arm, the Royal Naval Air Service, was at the forefront in shaping air power. Its seaplanes provided the eyes for the fleet. Land-based fighters fought on the Western Front with notable success, and offensive bombing operations were launched against the Zeppelin bases. And in 1917, the first deck landing had been successfully carried out. The first man to land an operational aeroplane on an operational warship underway, making way at sea, was Squadron Commander Dunning in 1917. He was operating from HMS Furious, which had been built with a flight deck 220 feet long, built over the forecastle. It was designed to enable aircraft to take off, but not land on, but he reckoned with a sop with pup, he had the performance to fly down the side of the ship, side slip over the deck and land on it, and he succeeded in doing it. That gave the Admiralty the idea that they could put a landing on deck after the funnel. And unfortunately, the turbulent airflow after the bridge and funnel and the funnel smoke made it so difficult to land on that the ship was impossible to operate. That left the Admiralty with the fear that turbulent air was going to be critical. Indeed, if you look at the lightweight aeroplanes of those days, they were little more than kites in terms of construction. A strong gust of wind, other than down the centre line, would have blown them overboard. So the Admiralty was left with a very real desire to get the optimal airflow over the deck to ease landing. And that lasted right up until the Second World War. But on the 1st of April 1918, the Royal Navy lost its air service when it was merged with the Army's air wing to form the Royal Air Force. In the years that followed, defence budgets were cut back and the RAF starved the Royal Navy's fleet air arm through the diversion of scarce resources to meet its own requirements. The interwar years were an unhappy period for naval aviation strategically because after the formation of the Royal Air Force in 1918, aviation, maritime naval aviation, had been split between two organizations. The Admiralty retained operational control of the aircraft embarked in ships at sea. The Air Ministry was responsible for the administrative control and training of the squadrons when they were ashore. They even took that to the length of aircrew having to have two commissions, one each in the Royal Navy and one in the Air Force. There's a misconception that commanding officers in the fleet tried to discourage their young men from learning to fly because they, said they thought somehow aviation wasn't the right thing to do. That's not true. What they were trying to say was that here you are, you're a lieutenant with five years service in the Royal Navy. Your contemporaries are going to go and be gunnery officers and torpedo officers. They will be senior officers in a destroyer squadron or a ship. You're going to go off and get a dual commission in the RAF where you'll be the equivalent of a midshipman while you learn to fly and the equivalent of a sub-lieutenant in your first squadron. You will be written on and reported as such. So the career was obviously brighter for those who took the conventional routes of gunnery. That was what they were trying to tell people. As a result, the Navy had the majority of aircrew who flew aircraft from ships at sea, but they followed a rather peculiar career pattern. Also, the Air Ministry was responsible for the procurement of aircraft. That was fine in the 1920s because there was realistically very little difference between an aircraft that was going to operate from a ship and an aircraft that would operate from land. 
But as engines developed, as aircraft became bigger, as weapons became bigger, as speeds became faster, everything militated against the joint aeroplane, and the Admiralty found itself increasingly having to have specialized aircraft designed to meet their own requirements. Pilot training was on types such as the Avro Tutor, which replaced the Avro 504 in 1933 as the service's basic trainer. Four survivors of this pre-war type remained with the fleet air arm at the start of World War II, the Tutor having been last used by frontline units in May 1937 with 811 Squadron. The last Tutor was retired from service in August 1942. Later, during the 1930s, the de Havilland Tiger Moth became the primary trainer. The Tiger Moth is one of the major success stories of aviation, which flew for the first time on the 26th of October, 1931. The Tiger Moth, along with the Harvard, was selected as the favoured trainer aircraft in Canada, Australia and New Zealand, as part of the Empire Air Training Scheme or the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and trained many fleet air arm personnel. The type is credited with training thousands of pilots for the Allied war effort, and remained in British service until as late as 1951. The fleet air arm received all its 113 Tiger Moths as various transfers from the RAF. The first was delivered to 780 Squadron at Leon Solent in May 1940. The aircraft were in naval service until September 1945. But frontline squadrons had to make do with navalized versions of RAF aircraft. For example, the Hawker Fury Fighter and Hawker Heart Bomber became the Nimrod and Osprey in Navy hands. These arrangements were not very satisfactory, and so in 1937, with war looming, the Royal Navy successfully argued the reversion of the service to full Admiralty control. The name Fleet Air Arm stems from the Trenchard Keys Agreement in 1924, where the Chief of the Naval Staff and the Chiefs of the Air Staff agreed that 70% of the pilots, all observers and all telegraphist air gunners, would be naval personnel. Um, it, followed an interim name which was something along the lines of RAF detachments to HM fleet which was completely unworkable. The Admiralty actually dreamt up the term fleet air arm. It originally referred to the fleet air arm of the RAF and it described those units specifically that operated at sea. The Admiralty when it took over aviation in 1939 decided to drop the term fleet air arm because to it it exemplified the interwar period of divided control. They introduced the new term air branch of the Royal Navy. And to a certain extent that caught on. People referred to themselves as branch types if they were aviators. But the term fleet air arm never died and even official documents published by the Central Office of Information referred to the fleet air arm. And after a long struggle, uh, the term was revived in 1953 as the official title for the Navy's air arm and it's been there ever since. The Royal Navy was still the largest in the world and included six aircraft carriers which had been converted from Great War battleships. But in 1938, the first of a new generation of purpose-built carriers was launched, the Ark Royal. A further five of the armored deck carriers were also under construction. In the countdown to war, the Admiralty began rebuilding its new air arm. We're very fortunate that the naval aviators in the fleet air arm between the wars were dedicated. They believed in what they did. That's why they overcame the difficulties about flying in the first place to be there. They were there because they wanted to be there and that the Admiralty was so enthusiastic about aviation that they fought to keep them there. The idea of striking at an enemy fleet didn't go away. In fact, during the Abyssinian crisis in 1936, the Admiralty resurrected plans to strike at an enemy fleet in its harbour and looked at attacking the Italian fleet at Taranto. Pilots were also given the opportunity to join the new service. The Japs were instructing us, for our RAF actually, uh, 
uh, to teach us how to drop the speedos apart from anything else. And uh, that, we did want to know that. But they, they didn't know anything about us, you see. And so they took us up in swordfish and said, uh, now th that is how you fly a swordfish, that's how you fly information. Now, um, you must be very careful in information. You mustn't get too close, you know, run into each other. So we said, oh, yes. And they said, right, well, go up and do formation of three of you, you see. And uh, as we told you, don't get too close. Don't do anything dangerous, you see. So we sort of looked at each other and uh, said, all right. And off we went. And uh, we had cooked up between us that we would meet and get into formation over one of these, uh, uh, you know, the fortresses out in the, uh, in the water, you see. And so we did, and got uh, into very, very close formation indeed, you see. <laughs> Came across uh, Gosport at about naught feet, actually jammed together, you see, and then did upward charlies and all sorts of things, like, and came down and said, um, you want us to fly like that? And they looked absolutely horrified, you see, and said, oh, well, look, we're terribly sorry, but we, we didn't know what you could do, you see. And... Uh, uh, we were far better information flying than most of them were, <laughs> actually. And um, so we said, look, uh, shall we tell you what we want to know? And we will get a course going for that. And they did. And it was really um, uh, quite uh, well done. At the onset of the Second World War, the fleet air arm consisted of 20 squadrons and 232 aircraft on strength. World War II gave a new impetus to naval flying, which gradually changed naval tactics from a ship versus ship conflict to aircraft versus ships, with devastating effect. The Gloucester Gladiator was the last British biplane fighter and was one of the few RAF aircraft that performed well in fleet air arm service. First flown in 1935, the Gladiator went into service with the RAF in 1936. The Sea Gladiator was the variant adopted by the fleet air arm. It was fitted with a deck arrester, catapult points, and carried a collapsible dinghy. Over 700 examples were built. The Gladiator was used during World War II in theatres where the RAF or Fleet Air Arm could not afford better equipment. The Gladiator took part in the Norwegian campaign in 1940 and triumphed during the first campaigns in the Mediterranean in 1940 to 1941, where it claimed shooting down numerous enemy aircraft. The Gladiator is probably best known for its role in the defence of Malta. From a stock of 18 aircraft of A22 Squadron that remained on Malta after HMS Glorious was sunk in 1940, three Sea Gladiators became international legends, Faith, Hope and Charity. They were part of the HAL Far Fighter Flight, composed of mixed RAF and Fleet Air Arm personnel. The same year that the Gladiator entered service also saw the arrival in service of the fairy swordfish, the legendary string bag. The swordfish was a torpedo, spotter and reconnaissance biplane dive bomber, which went into service with the fleet air arm in 1936. The nickname string bag indicated the versatility of the swordfish, which could carry an unlikely combination of loads, but also referred to its jungle of bracing wires which belonged to a past age. Yet the swordfish remained operational until the end of the war, gaining the distinction of being the last biplane to see active service. Well, one really felt that one was stepping backwards into a swordfish, because the Heinz was very nice airplane to fly, and actually we were just waiting in the Heinz squadron to have it replaced with uh, uh, monoplanes. And, uh, so we really were not impressed by the swordfish. And the great thing about the swordfish, so we found was it didn't matter what you did to it. Um, it just went on flying just the same. I mean, some years later, when I was commanding a squadron with um, the swordfish, and I tried to make it do various things. I tried to get one to spin. I just could not make it spin. I mean, you did all the things I said to put it into a spin, 
And as soon as you let the control go, it just flew itself back in a straight level flight. And um, <laughs> this is ridiculous. That was why I never became a trainer. <laughs> it was really an aircraft that told you before you did anything silly, you know. It really was a quite remarkable aircraft to fly. The first frontline squadron to be equipped with the fairy swordfish was 825 Squadron in July 1936 on HMS Glorious. At the outbreak of war, the fleet air arm had 13 squadrons equipped with swordfishes, most of them based on the six fleet carriers and three flights of swordfishes with floats that operated from catapult-equipped warships. I love the old swordfish. The, uh... It's a very easy aircraft to fly, of course. The, uh, and uh, I think one of the outstanding parts I found of the old swordfish was being catapulted off a catapult. They, they, used, they used cordite from an 18-inch gun, and you froze, you were on the sat in the catapult, and you froze your controls, and then the, there was a little wheel up at the top side. You got your stick and wound the wheel tight, and this froze your stick. And then you said, OK, and they fired the catapult off. And about 300 feet, you shook your head and sort of came to and unloosened the wheel and took over the aircraft. And this is when you were just learning to fly the thing, just learnt to fly the things. It, uh, it was quite an experience. Later swordfish were equipped with radar and rocket projectiles for anti-submarine operations. Although considered obsolete by the outbreak of war, the swordfish had a long and successful operational history and won many battle honours. But the swordfish's combat career did not begin well. At the outbreak of war, the Navy's carriers were tasked with submarine patrols, a role they were ill-suited for. In the opening months of 1939, the carriers were initially misused because the RAF's Coastal Command didn't have the numbers of aircraft needed to patrol the southwest approaches to the UK. So three carriers were misemployed using their swordfish area aircraft to carry out patrols. And Art Royal was attacked and narrowly missed. Courageous was hit and sunk with her valuable air group and her invaluable air crew, who were very difficult to replace. Um, they should never have been there. And in fact, the role they were employed in, uh, searching a focal point for a U-boat, was never going to be successful because it's far more likely that the U-boat would find you than you would find it with the technology of the day. But interestingly, Art Royal, properly used as part of a balanced fleet in the North Sea, was responsible, her fighters were responsible for shooting down the first Axis aeroplane of World War II. And it's interesting to note that the last Axis aircraft of World War II was shot down on VJ Day by sea fires from uh, Indefatigable. So the Royal Navy was responsible for both the first and the last kill of World War II. After the tragic loss of Courageous, there was little combat until the German invasion of Norway in the spring of 1940, when the swordfish saw its first real action in April during the Battle of Narvik. The attack on the 11th of April 1940 by swordfish from HMS Furious was the first airborne torpedo attack of the war when they launched an attack on two destroyers at harbour in Trondheim. The attack was ineffective. Over the next two weeks, swordfish conducted constant sorties in Norwegian waters, performing strikes, reconnaissance and anti-submarine patrols under severe weather conditions. Disaster struck on the 9th of June, when many swordfish and their crews were lost with Glorious when she was sunk by the German capital ships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. In April and May 1940, the swordfish operated in France, covering the retreat of the British Expeditionary Force, and took part in the defense of the BEF during the Dunkirk evacuation on the 31st of May, and was even involved in bombing advancing troops and tanks. The Nazi blitzkrieg against the Low Countries and France forced the RAF and Fleet Air Arm to call on every resource they had to stave off complete disaster. Four squadrons flying from land bases were put to every task for which they were capable. Mine laying, bombing of naval and ground targets, spotting and reconnaissance. Many of these missions were flown by single aircraft for many hours alone throughout the night. Their task went on into the Battle of Britain period from July until October 1940. 
In the summer of 1940, Britain's back was against the wall. Italy's dictator, Benito Mussolini, saw this as his opportunity to seize more power in North Africa, and so declared war on Britain. But he had not reckoned on the striking power of the swordfish. The Malta-based swordfish flew anti-shipping strikes, usually at night against Italian convoys sailing for North Africa. They sank, on average, 50,000 tons per month. But when France fell, the Admiralty was faced with a terrible dilemma. As an ally, her navy had been expected to play a part in protecting the convoys to North Africa. Particularly useful were four capital ships now sheltering in the port of Iran in French Algiers. They could not be allowed to fall into enemy hands. Ark Royal had sailed as part of Force H from Gibraltar and was now holding station off the coast. With all requests to surrender rejected, Force H opened fire. Twelve swordfish from Ark Royal launched a torpedo attack hitting the battlecruiser Dunkirk and putting it out of action. It was a tragic and unhappy episode which brought an end to French sea power in the Mediterranean. The next month, on the 22nd of August, three swordfish delivered yet another devastating blow, this time in Libya. The one thing we didn't like in the swordfish was uh, fighters. So we went about a number of miles out to sea for 40, 50 miles. Um, then um, along the North African coast, uh, past the brook, and uh, the one thing, of course, the Navy could do was navigate, and so the leader, who was um, a Royal Marine, Ollie Patch, um, uh, we all turned in at the right moment, and there in front of us was um, Bomber Harbour, and right in the middle of it was a very large submarine, um, which was uh, obviously charging the batteries because they were all lying around, uh, it was lunchtime, they were all lying around on decks, sunbathing, you see, poor chaps. And uh, so uh, Ollie, who was the, the leader in the middle, um, he aimed straight for it and dropped the fish, which naturally hit it, you couldn't very well miss it, and uh, he was only doing about two or three knots, you see. And uh, this blew up and sank very effectively. The other chap, uh, the other called Cheeseman and I, went down each side of this thing. A couple of characters uh, had a woken up, really, on the, um, in the conning tower, I mean, and they started shooting at us, so um, on we went, one down each side, and I went down the left-hand side, right, right in front of me was um, an enormous uh, uh, devil ship, huge thing. Well, I couldn't very well miss that, but uh, by that time they, they started shooting at me, which was very un unfriendly, and the, um, I did realize until later that uh, one had hit me, in fact, however, I dropped the fish, and um, I had seen, as we were approaching, that there's a, the destroyer was at the far side of the um, devil ship, and beyond that was a submarine. Yeah? And uh, so while I was only interested at that point of hitting the uh, devil ship, so I dropped my torpedo at that, um, then um, departed at high speed. Uh, at that stage in any operation, you're uh, Self-preservation is the only thing you're really thinking about, and um, uh, aimed at getting back to sea. And uh, uh, I then discovered that my observer was sort of dancing up and down, waving his arms about in the cockpit. And um, so um, I eventually managed to press upon him as if he used the intercom. I didn't have no idea what he was talking about, and he said they've all blown up. You see. So um, I asked for a bit of explanation, and um, he said the depot ship has exploded. Now, I must have hit the magazine by pure accident. The success of these attacks on ships in harbour led the Admiralty to consider a much more aggressive operation against the Italian Navy. A torpedo bomber attack against the Italian fleet at Taranto, on the southeastern tip of the Italian mainland. The plan, codenamed Operation Judgment, specified a night attack to reduce losses among the attacking aircraft. The operation was scheduled for the 21st of October 1940, but was delayed to the 11th of November due to other naval commitments. Unfortunately, they had a fire in the hangar last year, and they lost a number of aircrafts. And then, later on, they lost three more uh, due to engine failure uh, of, on fuel, which was uh, faulty fuel provided by a tanker. <laughs> 
called the Tom Mine or something it was called, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, um, they lost these aircraft. And we ended up with only 21 aircraft instead of what we had. And so, um, and that was partly from Eagle, because Eagle, uh, Eagle's aircraft were not in a, in a very good state because we'd been bombed continually by the Regia Aeronautica. And we had all this, um, the, the ship had been shaken to pieces, and the plumbing had got into a bit of a mess, and you were never quite sure really where you were going to fill an aircraft with, uh, with a aviation, especially, or it was the residue from the Royal Marines' heads, you know. And a lot of people suggested, actually, that they'd probably have run better on that, but never mind. Uh, and th th that was how we ended up with such a small number of aircrafts. On the morning of the 11th of November, 1940, five Italian battleships were in Taranto Harbour, with three cruisers at dock protected by anti-submarine nets. The sixth battleship was seen to enter the harbour later that day. This represented the entire Italian battle fleet. Although Taranto was one of the best defended ports in Europe, Mussolini had put all his eggs in one basket. By 20 hundred hours, Illustrious and her escorts were in position, about 170 miles from the port. Pilots were briefed for what many thought would be a suicide mission. Well, the atmosphere was very enthusiastic, really, because um, we were probably overconfident, but most of us felt that um, we were rather good at this, hitting things in harbor, and that uh, uh, six working great battleships uh, shouldn't be all that difficult to hit, you see. But um, then we had, the intelligence was very good from Italy, um, because a lot of Italians actually were pro-British, strangely enough, and the, um, uh, we knew the anti-aircraft uh, regions were tremendous. And we thought, whoa. Uh, however, we thought, well, we've met this stuff before, it should be all right. Um, but the, uh, what we didn't know was that the staff had worked out that uh, we could accept 50% casualties. They didn't tell us that, of course. Um, there'd be a lack of enthusiasm if they said that. Of the first strike of 12 swordfish, six carried torpedoes, four carried bombs, and two carried a combination of bombs and flares. The two flare droppers put a line of flares over the harbor from 7,500 feet and then bombed an oil storage depot. A second wave of five aircraft armed with torpedoes, two armed with bombs and two armed with flares and bombs took off nearly an hour later after the first wave. Well, the, the first sight actually we saw really from about 30 miles away. Um, we didn't know what it was at first, but the, the, the sky was uh, definitely illuminated, a bit sort of flashing and uh, uh, real sort of box benefit going on, um, on the thing, you see. And it was only when we got closer that we appreciated there was anti-aircraft fire. And our reaction to that, really, was, was a bit odd, because the first people must have cleared by now what they're still shooting at, you see. <laughs> However, they obviously were. So um, we were slightly concerned when we saw the amount of anti-aircraft fire. We thought, well, so on we went, actually, and um, uh, my crowd, uh, well, there were only nine of us, the second one, um, w uh, approached the harbor. Well, as we uh, approached the actual harbor entrance, um, the, uh, those who were going to drop the flares for us to illuminate the, uh, give us a background, really, um, they broke away over to starboard, to the east side of the um, uh, harbour, which was a very fine harbour, actually, and about four miles across, been a great harbour ever since the days of the Phoenicians, about 1000 BC. And uh, the rest of us approached the direction we wanted to be. Now, to get the uh, battleships, you wanted to really to come in from the um, left-hand side, which was the westerly side, you see. And uh, so we went on in, in virtually into the harbor, uh, towards the island, actually. And when we were going off to the left, the, the whole idea of the coordinated uh, torpedo attack was scrubbed out, actually. It was obviously quite impossible. And in fact, this had been appreciated by the, the planners and the staff. Um, and uh, that's why virtually every pilot uh, in the uh, verbal things had dropped a pillow the night before, you know. Uh, 
So it was like, you do your own thing. And so we did. And as we came in, into the harbour towards the left-hand side, that would be the westerly side, uh, I saw a hole in the in anti-aircraft fire. So I said, ah, that's for Welland, you see. And instantly, unfortunately, by the time I got there, it wasn't a hole any longer. It was unfortunate. Although his aircraft had been hit, John Wellham pressed home his attack. I straightened up, uh, pointed at his ship, uh, which was uh, where I wanted to be, but, and I got the right speed by then, but the thing um, was that the only way I could fly straight was skidding with the le left rudder, and uh, torpedoes in these days didn't like that. You had to be at the right height, the right speed, the right everything. So the one thing I could not do was fly the thing straight. So, however, all I could do was to um, do my best to fly it straight. And uh, I let this people go thinking that's not going to hit with a um, skidding like that. And, uh, but as soon as you drop 2,000 pounds of torpedo, of anything actually, an aircraft goes up. There's nothing you can do about it. So w we went up, at which time I was in a very steep turn to, to starboard to get out of there. And um, we cleared it, but by the fact that having lost the weight, we went upwards, I went into the anti-aircraft fire for the ship, which, of course, was firing at me, but up till then, uh, they couldn't deflect the guns enough, which was a very good thing. And um, so having just gone into that, um, there was another terrific thump. And um, I don't know what, something had hit me, obviously. However, it straightened the thing up, and the aircraft was still flying. Uh, it was rather remarkable. I didn't know how, know how well or how far it was going to keep flying. So um, I uh, aimed at what I could remember was the bit in between the balloons. Uh, there were two areas of balloons, you see, and there's a great breakwater there, and uh, the balloons were on, on that, and got in between them and uh, aimed at the entrance, the, the island of uh, San Paolo, actually. And um, uh, fine. And they were shooting like mad from there, but uh, over the harbor, not over me. So I thought, that's good. Uh, meanwhile, the battleship that was still firing was firing in our direction. Most of that was going over the top. And so I suddenly found myself outside the harbor again. Following their attack, the air crews had to find their way back to the fleet, a journey of nearly 200 miles at night. So I started to climb and uh, checked up and everything. The engine instruments were behaving quite nicely. The flying instruments were all over the place because I was flying and skidding, you see. Nothing much I could do about that. So I thought, well, I wonder if Pat's all right because he was a very, very fine observer. He never interfered with doing my part of ship. So uh, I said, uh, are you all right, Pat? And there was a sort of noise like someone in a, uh, an indecent telephone call, you know, sort of deep breathing. And uh, he said, well, uh, physically, yes. So, oh. Um, and uh, I said, well, uh, I'm all right. But uh, he said, is this threatened flying machine going to get us home? And I said, well, I haven't got a clue, but uh, uh, I think there's a fair chance, and I'd rather carry on. I don't fancy eating spaghetti for the rest of the war, you see. And he said, all right. So I said, if you give me a course to steer, uh, it would make it a bit easier for you. And he said, well, you'll have to wait a minute, because I, I, when you've been chucking the aeroplane about like this, I've lost all my scars and everything else in the bottom of the cockpit. All the aircraft, except two that had been shot down, were back on board Illustrious before 3 a.m. that morning. Well, the first reception, from my point of view, was um, uh, slightly alarming because not being able to turn properly to the left, um, I had to do a very wide circuit, you see, around Illustrious, having flown over her, did this very wide circuit, came back, and I thought, well, right, well, I've got it right, because I was coming right up towards the sun, I was smashing, you see, and uh, then throttled back to the approved deck landing speed for a solid fish, and as soon as I did that, the thing came out of my hand. I couldn't control it at all. I thought, oh, my God. So I banged the throttle wide open, actually, it was enough, you see. Yeah, control of the thing. 
and the, the batsman, the DLCO, was giving me furious too fast signals. So I thought, well, hard huh, luck, chum, but I'm not going to get any slower because I'm going to fall out of my hand. So um, I came over the deck much too fast, but he's a very experienced bloke, actually. He saw there's some reason for this and um, gave me a very early cut signal, which I, I didn't, hadn't quite reached the stern, in fact, when I cut the engine. And I floated down the deck um, too fast and too high, actually. And um, by great good force, it was true, a lot more than anything else, I think. Uh, the arrestor hook, um, which by then I, I knew must be down, because I, I don't know what I'm telling you, see. Um, it, it picked up a wire and um, stopped us dead in the air and came down thump on the deck, you see. And it, it sat for a moment, because one then thought, good Lord, we're back. We didn't really expect any of them back, or we would have, well, we just didn't. Uh, and so when they started to come in and started to land on, we were just overjoyed with it. And so what were we doing? Uh, peering underneath the main planes, what we were all doing. Yeah, torpedoes gone, yeah, bombs gone, flares are gone. They dropped them someplace. Great! Aerial reconnaissance the following day showed just how devastating the attack had been. The Italians withdrew their fleet to the north, and although they would continue to harass the Mediterranean convoys, their fleet never recovered. An unfortunate consequence of Taranto was that it proved to the Japanese that such a plan was viable, that they could use their considerable carrier force in the same way. On December the 4th, 1941, the fleet arrived off Hawaii. Waves of aircraft were launched. Their target, the US Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. A second consequence was that Hitler ordered General Erwin Rommel and the Africa Corps and the Number 10 Flieger Corps to shore up his Italian ally. The air attacks on the convoys and the battle for Malta, a vital staging post in the Western Mediterranean, became even more deadly, as illustrious found to her cost. They came over wave after wave after wave. And, um, and the ship was hit numerous times, some with very heavy bombs. And one, for example, went down the after lift well and uh, virtually upended the complete lift. And, uh, and that was largely responsible also for the, uh, and what went down afterwards, making the flight deck look like a corrugated roof. And that was six inches of metal. Yep. And uh, I remember that Two of the pom-poms crews were wiped out pretty viciously in all this. It, it was just, it was just horror. There were fires, there was damage down below. The flight deck was a shambles. Um, some of the guns were grassy wiped out. Um, I don't know, we survived. Although America had not yet entered the war in 1941, she was sending vital supplies and armaments to the United Kingdom. Air cover was restricted by the range of the aircraft available, and so the convoys were exposed in the mid-Atlantic. Below the waves lurked the U-boats, while on the surface, mighty battleships waited. Among the most feared was the Bismarck. On May the 18th, 1941, Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen set sail for the Atlantic. On the 24th, Hood and the Prince of Wales intercepted them. In the ensuing action, Hood was sunk with all but three of her crew. It was a devastating blow. The order went out that Bismarck was to be sunk at all costs. On the 24th of May, 1941, the new carrier Victorious launched nine swordfish to intercept the Bismarck in the North Atlantic. But with bad weather conditions, the aircraft only scored a single hit. On the 26th of May, swordfishes were launched by the carrier HMS Ark Royal but attacked the British cruiser Sheffield by mistake. But later in the day, 15 swordfish were launched in a storm carrying a new type of torpedo armed with contact detonators. They scored two hits on the German battleship. One did no damage, but the other struck and disabled the Bismarck steering gear. None of the aircraft were lost in the attack, and a German officer said later 
It was incredible to see such obsolete looking planes having the nerve to attack a fire spitting mountain like the Bismarck. Unable to escape her pursuers, the Bismarck was sunk by gunfire and torpedoes from the Royal Navy fleet the next day. But the Swordfish's days were numbered in its strike role. The Scharnhorst, along with Gneisenau and Prince Eugen, were holed up in the French Atlantic port of Brest, where they were constantly attacked by RAF Bomber Command, but to little effect. Hitler, fearing an invasion of Norway, ordered them back. On February the 12th, 1942, the tides were just right. Also, the weather was foul, ideal for such a voyage. Six swordfish from 825 Squadron, operating out of Manston in Kent, were scrambled to intercept the German ships. All were shot down, and 13 of the 18 crew perished. For this action, Lieutenant Commander Eugene Esmond was posthumously awarded the Fleet Air Arms' first Victoria Cross of the Second World War. The swordfish was never again used as a torpedo bomber. However, it would continue to be employed in another role in the Battle of the Atlantic against the U-boats until the end of the war. A new type of carrier had been devised to provide air cover for the convoys. They were called MAC ships, or Merchant Armed Carriers. These were grain or oil tankers with their superstructure replaced by a flight deck so that they could carry aircraft as well as cargo. There was minimal aircraft support and the crews were a mix of naval and civilian personnel. But everyone mucked in and helped and the MAC ships proved to be a very successful weapon in the fight against the U-boats, bridging the gap in air cover in the mid-Atlantic. In their anti-submarine role, the swordfish were very successful. Flying ahead of the convoy, they used radar to detect the submarines. In total, swordfishes claimed over 20 U-boats. After the Battle of the Atlantic began to subside in May 1943, the swordfish began escorting the Russian convoys to Murmansk through Arctic waters. In September 1944, swordfishes from the escort carrier Vindex sank four U-boats in one voyage. The final swordfish was delivered in August 1944, and the last frontline swordfish fleet air arm unit was 836 Squadron, which disbanded on the 21st of May 1945. However, the swordfish continued in second-line training duties until summer 1946. The very last two swordfish retired as late as 1952. By the end of production in 1944, a total of 2,396 aircraft had been built. The swordfish was the only fleet air arm aircraft to see service from the first day to the last day of the war. This is quite a record for an airplane that was considered obsolete at the time the war broke out. Not long after the swordfish entered service, the fleet air arm began receiving its first all-metal monoplane, the Blackburn Skewer. The skewer was designed as a dive bomber with a distinctive greenhouse cockpit. Constructed as an all-metal aircraft, it departed from Royal Navy tradition of fabric-covered aircraft. It was also the Fleet Air Arm's first naval dive bomber and their first deck landing aircraft to have flaps, retractable landing gear and a variable pitch propeller. It was a, a very good aircraft, but it was slow and heavy. They had what? Too, they used to say it was too big, too slow, and too late. <laughs> well, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a vicious aircraft, unless, of course, it got into a spin, and then it wouldn't come out of a spin, which uh, isn't very good for a fighter aircraft. The parachute on the skewer was put in by Blackburn because the thing wouldn't come out of a spin, and, and this was for a fighter aircraft. You know, you should be able to spin the thing and do any, practically any maneuver and still recover. But they solved this problem by not getting out of the spin by putting a great big parachute into the tail. And if you got into a spin, the object was to pull a lever in the cockpit, and it deployed the parachute. And the parachute held the skewer by the tail until it stopped spinning. Then you jettison the, the parachute and the thing, and instead of flying away nicely and giving power and pulling away, the thing dropped like a stone. It didn't really have enough power to pull out of the dive. So 
<laughs> Nobody, uh, as far as I know, ever deployed their parachute. Some guy sticks it out and said, I won't even be tempted to pull this thing. <laughs> Although rather out of date in comparison with opposing German aircraft at the time, the skewer went on to have a significant impact in the early war period and made its mark in history. Skewers were the first British aircraft to shoot down a German aircraft in World War II. And skewers sank the German cruiser Königsberg, which was the first large warship sunk by Allied forces in the war. But on the 13th of June 1940, calamity struck when skewers of 800 Squadron, operating off Ark Royal, were involved in dive bombing the German capital ship Scharnhorst at Trondheim. Many of the aircraft were shot down by Messerschmitt Bf 109s. Well, the um, uh, <coughs> everybody is very disheartened when they found that the uh, Scharnhorst and uh, Neisnau were in Trondheim Harbor, because they knew that it was a, a very uh, hopeless situation with the defenses they had there. And uh, so our briefing uh, the night before was very brief. Uh, to just go in and do the best you can, really, and uh, we wish you luck. And we went down, we were due to take off at midnight. We went down to the bar, and the bar opened up, and the old Ark Royal, and we all had a couple of drinks, and they wished us luck, and uh, you climbed off. And when we got there, it was a beautiful morning, uh, clear, cloudless, and uh, unfortunately, it was so beautiful that we needed clouds. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the fighters, we I could see ahead of when we, we had 60 miles up the fjord at Trondheim to get to the, uh, and the old skewer is fairly slow. And I could see the guys, I was towards the end of the thing, being a sub-lieutenant, and uh, number three in the formation or whatever it was. And you see some of the guys ahead going down in flames, some just went straight into the sea, and the fighters, uh, uh, you could others going in where the fighters broke off as you get closer to the ship and the flak took over. And that, I think, was more in, very intense and accurate. So it was a bit of a shambles, shall we say. I got hit uh, going in. We got a fighter attack and came in because of the cannon shell through my main tank just behind me. And then I got hit on the side with some bullets and uh, I could feel the old blood running down my shoe and knew we were in trouble. <coughs> and, uh, so and it, uh, the aircraft had been shot. By the time I got to the dive bomb position, the aircraft had been shot up very badly. And then in the dive bomb, the flaps going down to 15 degrees, which brought it down nicely. Uh, but the flak coming up, you could just see bits and pieces pulling off the old aircraft. So the, and I found it hard to adjust the aircraft to get it in the right spot where you knew the old bomb was going to fall in it. And, and but we had uh, semi-armor-piercing bombs on, so they had to be released at about 4,000 feet. And I was still trying to get it, so I think I missed it. I might have come close to the side, but missed it. The skewer was again in combat the following month during the Dunkirk evacuation. On the 24th of September 1940, skewers of 803 Squadron of Ark Royal took part in the Operation Menace attack on French warships at Dakar. Finally, in 1941, the skewer was withdrawn from frontline service, although the last example was not retired from naval service until March 1945. The Blackburn Rock which was developed from the skewer, was the first fleet air arm aircraft to have a power-driven gun turret. The ROC entered service with 800 and 803 squadrons on the 4th of April 1939. The aircraft operated from shore bases only, and its frontline career ended in June 1940, as it was slow and had poor stability. Its one good characteristic was that it could maintain a steep dive. Only one ROC was reported to have been involved in combat between 1939 to 1945. This was when, on the 21st of June 1940, a ROC from 801 Squadron took part in an attack on a gunnery battery near Calais. The aircraft was shot down and both of the crew killed. The Fairy Fulmer was designed to meet the Admiralty's urgent need for a modern shipboard fighter. 
The Fulmar prototype was first flown on the 4th of January 1940 and then rushed into production. The Fulmar was the Fleet Air Arm's first carrier-based fighter with the same weight and firepower of the RAF's Hurricane and Spitfire. In fact, the Fulmar was developed for the Fleet Air Arm after being rejected by the RAF. The type was delivered to A26 Squadron in June 1940, before embarking on Illustrious in August. Fulmars fought in every wartime theatre, playing a particularly important role in protecting the Malta convoys. But its lack of speed and the Admiralty's need for a truly modern carrier-based fighter led to the Fulmar being replaced by the Supermarine Seafire during 1943. With no Spitfires or Hurricanes available, the Navy was forced to look to the United States for a suitable carrier fighter. The Grumman F4F Wildcat, or Martlet, was Grumman's first monoplane and one of the outstanding naval fighters of World War II. This American fighter was called the Martlet by the Royal Navy until March 1944, when it reverted to the US name Wildcat. The Wildcat was the main shipboard fighter when the US entered World War II. Although the Japanese Mitsubishi Zero outperformed it, the Wildcat was well-armed and reliable and was a natural shipboard aircraft, probably easier to land on a carrier deck than on land. It set the reputation of Grumman for building immensely strong aircraft. Its first flight was made from Grumman's Long Island factory on the 2nd of September 1937. In June 1940, a French order was transferred to Britain and the first aircraft, with its British name of Martlet 1, was delivered on the 27th of July that year, ahead of deliveries to the US Navy. The advent of the escort carrier led to development of the final Wildcat version, using a more powerful Wright Cyclone engine with a lighter airframe to obtain improved takeoff performance from the shorter carrier decks. Between 1940 and 1945, the fleet air arm received 1,172 Wildcats in total. The first Wildcats to see action were flown by the Royal Navy, claiming their first victory on the 25th of December 1940, almost a full year before the first American Wildcat saw action at Wake Island. The fleet air arm and the US Navy also took the Wildcat into operation in North Africa in November 1942. The Wildcat was one of the Fleet Air Arm's primary naval fighters until the end of 1942. However, during 1943, Wildcat squadrons started to be re-equipped with either the larger Grumman F6F Hellcat or the chance bought F4U Corsair. The Hawker Sea Hurricane was a variant of the legendary Hawker Hurricane. During World War II, the Fleet Air Arm took on charge some 440 Sea Hurricanes, 60 of which were built new as Sea Hurricanes, and the rest were conversions from former RAF Hurricanes, some of which dated from 1938. The Hawker Hurricane prototype first took to the air on the 6th of November 1935 and became operational in 1937. It was a monoplane fighter with an enclosed cockpit and retractable undercarriage, and the RAF's first fighter capable of a level speed in excess of 300 miles per hour. It was also its first eight-gun fighter. The Hurricane shouldered the lion's share of Britain's defense during the Battle of Britain, and was largely responsible for the successful outcome of the battle, equipping more than three-fifths of RAF Fighter Command squadrons. When it became clear that the Hurricane was becoming outclassed as a pure fighter, other duties were assigned to it, including naval operations. The Royal Navy was keen to acquire the Hurricane to help in the Battle of the Atlantic, which in early 1940 had seen a steep rise in shipping losses far from shore, in areas where land-based aircraft could not provide air cover for Allied convoys. This gave rise to the Hurricat, a converted Hurricane carried by catapult-armed merchantmen, or CAM ships. The Hurricat was launched from a catapult at the ship's bows on what was usually a one-way flight. After providing defence for the convoy, there was nowhere for the pilot to land, 
which meant he was obliged to bail out or ditch his aircraft as near as possible to the convoy, hoping to be picked up. The first of the Sea Hurricanes to see service with the fleet air arm arrived in February 1941 and were operating with Frontline Unit 880 Squadron from the 15th of March 1941. The Sea Hurricane's most famous action was fought during August 1942, when aircraft serving with 801, 802 and 885 squadrons aboard the carriers Indomitable, Eagle and Victorious, joined with Fairy Fulmars and Grumman Martlets to protect a vital convoy to Malta in Operation Pedestal. During three days of almost continuous attack by an Axis force of bombers, torpedo bombers and escorting fighters, 39 enemy aircraft were destroyed for the loss of eight naval fighters. From October 1941, hooked hurricanes were deployed on the new MAC ships, which were a vast improvement over the CAM ships as the aircraft could land back. The Sea Hurricane last saw service in 1945. The fleet air arm also operated the Supermarine Sea Fire, or Sea Spitfire, to give it its official name. Although Supermarine had approached the Admiralty with a specifically designed naval version of the Spitfire as early as 1938, the fleet air arm had to wait until September 1941 before it got its hands on this legendary fighter. These were Mark V versions, and although they were every bit as good in air combat, operating from ships as they were from land, they simply were not strong enough to cope with the rigours of carrier operations. It came down to how much experience the squadron had. Uh, we all started off with uh, deck landing problems. That was the, the major thing about the Seafire, was it had a very delicate undercarriage compared with what we'd been used to. Uh, it was... Um, uh, lightly built up to a point. Uh, you, you, if you landed too fast, you were likely to pull the, the hook out of the fuselage, or bend it anyway. But uh, it was a magnificent airplane in the air, and what, if you could gather enough experience, then it was a first-class fighting weapon, e even on a carrier. But um, uh, one still has to train people, and it's quite an expensive process losing aircraft while you, when you are training them. More sea fires were lost to breaking their landing gear in hard landings than to all enemy causes. Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily in 1943, showed just how fragile the sea fire was. Of the 106 initially deployed, less than 50 survived the first 48 hours due to landing accidents, and only 23 were serviceable when the operation concluded. However, the Sea Fire played a useful role as a fleet defence fighter in the Indian Ocean and Far Eastern theatres. Indeed, the Sea Fire was the first fleet air arm aircraft to fly over Japan in the summer of 1945. A Sea Fire fighter of the Royal Navy shot down the last enemy aircraft on the very day of the Japanese surrender in August 1945. Sea Fires also saw combat in Korea with number 800 Squadron flying their last missions in 1950. These aircraft were able to carry three 500-pound bombs, or eight rockets, and were 100 miles per hour faster and 5,000 pounds heavier than the first versions of the Sea Fire. The first monoplane torpedo bomber of the fleet air arm, the Ferry Barracuda, was designed in Britain as a three-seat torpedo bomber reconnaissance aircraft, which began entering service in late 1943. The Barracuda was a cantilever shoulder wing monoplane of all metal construction, the foldable wings incorporating trailing edge flaps that gave the aircraft a much improved performance capability over its predecessors. The fuselage housed a crew of three in tandem cockpits, enclosed by a long greenhouse canopy. Because of the high priority given to RAF fighters and bombers, the prototype did not fly until the 29th of June 1941. And it was not until February 1942 that service trials and evaluation were completed. <laughs> 
These showed the need for airframe strengthening, which, together with the addition of equipment not included in the original specification, resulted in the Barracuda suffering from a weight problem that persisted through its service life, seriously reducing takeoff and climb performance. The Barracuda Mark II was the main production version powered by a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. In all, 1,688 Barracuda Mark IIs were built. No fewer than 2,572 Barracudas of all marks were delivered to the fleet air arm. The Barracuda began entering service in late 1943, equipping 23 first-line squadrons. It gained a measure of fame in attacks on the German battleship Tirpitz in the spring and summer of 1944 in Arctic Norway. It went on to serve with the British Pacific Fleet, as well as seeing some post-war service. The Fairy Firefly was initially designed as a two-seat fleet reconnaissance fighter based on the Fairy Fulmar. The prototype first flew on the 22nd of December 1941. It had a low-wing monoplane configuration with a wide track undercarriage, smaller than the Fulmar, and provided with a more powerful engine, the Rolls-Royce Griffin. The design was deliberately conventional to bring it into service quickly. The plane carried four 20mm guns mounted in the wings and 16 60-pound rockets or two 1,000-pound bombs. Early Fireflies had a deep beard radiator. Later models had intakes in the wing route. The aircraft went into production on the 26th of August 1942 and the first production aircraft were delivered in March 1943. One of the aeroplane's most interesting features is the housing of the pilot and navigator weapons officer in separate compartments. In addition, the innovative wing flaps, when extended, increased both the wing area and, in turn, their lift. This last feature made the heavy firefly docile during landings on aircraft carrier decks. The first operational sortie of the fairy firefly was in July 1944 when 1770 Squadron flew from Indefatigable and took part in the Barracuda-led dive-bombing attacks against the German battleship Tirpitz. In January 1945, the same squadron was involved in the first major action by the fleet air arm against the Japanese, when the oil refineries in Sumatra were set ablaze with rockets. Fleet air arm fireflies also saw action during the Korean War, operating from carriers against communist ground targets. The last of the 1,702 built was delivered in 1956. The Firefly ended its naval career as a target drone. The Grumman F6F Hellcat was an American-designed carrier fighter. Its design began as a development of the Wildcat, but soon evolved into a much larger, more powerful and more capable aircraft. The Hellcat was designed and put into service in a very short period in order to counteract the Japanese A6M-0 from the second half of 1943 onwards and soon became the main shipboard fighter of the US Navy for the last two years of the Pacific War. The Hellcat was the most successful Allied fighter in World War II with over 5,000 aerial victories. In order to keep the takeoff and landing speeds at a reasonable level, Grumman made the wings proportionately larger than most aircraft to reduce wing loading. In fact, the Hellcat had the largest wing area of any single engine fighter in World War II at 334 square feet. In 1942, the design was adapted to take into account the analysis of the first ever captured and undamaged Japanese Zero. The information from the test flight of the Zero aided in the final design development of the Hellcat. The prototype was marginally slower than the Zero, and so a larger Pratt & Whitney double wasp engine was installed. This engine boosted the Hellcat's top speed to 370 miles per hour, 29 miles per hour faster than the Zero. The Hellcat was used extensively as a search aircraft and fighter bomber, 
playing a major part in strikes on Japanese warships and mercantile shipping in 1944 and 1945. In this role, and for ground attack, it could carry up to 2,000 pounds of bombs, or be armed with six five-inch rockets on underwing pylons. The first Hellcat Mark I's were delivered to the fleet air arm on the 13th of March, 1943. Production continued until November 1945, by which time the Hellcat equipped 14 fleet air arm squadrons. The first fleet air arm squadron to receive the Hellcat was 800 Squadron in July 1943. The fleet air arms Hellcats operated in the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific aboard both assault carriers and fleet carriers. Although aerial combat encounters were limited, it still managed to account for 52 kills during the war. The final 293 Hellcats to be delivered to the fleet air arm arrived between January and May 1945. The very last aircraft being delivered on the 11th of May 1945. Some remained in service after the war. The Grumman Tarpon was an American-developed monoplane, carrier-borne torpedo light bomber, with cabins for a crew of three, pilot, observer, and telegraphist air gunner, or TAG. Originally, the fleet air arm named the aircraft the Grumman Tarpon, changing to Avenger in January 1944 to conform to US Navy nomenclature. Developed from the TBD-1 Devastator, the Avenger was Grumman's first torpedo aircraft and its robust design had much in common with that of the company's fighters. The order for two prototypes was placed on the 8th of April 1940, and the first Avengers went into service just over two years later. The Royal Navy received 402 aircraft designated TBF-1Bs under the Lend-Lease arrangement. The first squadron, 832, embarked on HMS Victoria 